Such an ambitious endeavour, which carries with it the expectations of a nation, requires an exceptional leader. And we believe Dr Megan Clark is the perfect choice. Dr Clark has a distinguished career in the mining sector before leading CSIRO. She has served on the Prime Minister's Science and Engineering and Innovation Council, as well as the Prime Minister's Task Force on Manufacturing. In 2014, she was appointed a Companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to scientific research and development through fostering innovation, to science administration through strategic leadership roles, and to the development of public policy for technological sciences. This experience made her an excellent choice to chair the Commonwealth Government's Space Policy Expert Reference Group that also included our, our SIAA Chair, Michael Davis. And on the 1st of July, she became the inaugural head of the new Australian Space Agency. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage this year's SIAA Distinguished Speaker, Dr Megan Clark. I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners, particularly as we're talking about Australia's future in space. I think it's wonderful to look back tens of thousands of years and uh, I know the Ghana people had a wonderful connection with space. In, in fact, from their stories, according to, uh, to Duane uh, Hamacher, the people of the Adelaide Plain saw the Great Milky Way as a winding river with the huts alongside the edge of the Milky Way and the dark patches of the Milky Way they saw as the deep, swirling and dangerous parts of that river. And the Southern Cross they saw as one of the great eagles will do. It's a wonderful connection, I think, with space. It's a real honour to deliver the SIA oration and in particular I wanted to thank the very many people who every step along the way made it possible for us to have a space agency. They worked tirelessly for many decades. Many of those people are here in the room and I just wanted to personally thank each and every one of those people who actually made this possible. We, we literally started um, just over a week ago, so it does seem very new. I can tell you that we are absolutely excited that after the efforts of many, we can, uh, we can get, uh, get going. I have to say on the Monday morning, which was July the 2nd, we'd geared up to start we literally wandered around in circles for about an hour because we'd worked so hard for that day and suddenly it was here so we I, can we let the team sort of walk around for a bit and said right that's it now we've got to get to work so uh, we we are so keen to do our very best to serve this nation but to also serve your vision we listen to the vision of the nation when you do something like this I think the nation is very wise and so we listened to the wisdom of the nation and we simply reflected that simple and very coherent vision back to the government. What, what could be simpler? And of course I was very lucky that the nation had a very single voice and knew exactly what it wanted. I, I think it was born a little bit out of frustration. Um, so it knew exactly what it wanted and that was delightful. I did want to acknowledge in absentia Michael Davis, who's the chair of SIA. Um, he was part of the expert review group uh, and a wonderful wise uh, counsel for the team. And of course, Naomi made us the deputy chair and with us the deputy Lord Mayor as well um, uh, is with us tonight. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Like many of you, um, I welcome the resounding $300 million investment by the federal government in the space sector in the May budget. It was not just a commitment to the agency, but this was a very strong and firm statement to the world that we were very serious this time. Also, the government supported all key recommendations of the review into Australia's space industry capability. Uh, which was really the nation's uh, voice. The budget had um, $260 million to do three very important projects. 
And I just want to quickly outline those for you. 161 million went to Geoscience Australia to lift up our GPS network, that network that allows us to know where we are with our phones, etc. All those GPS chips that sit in so many devices. We were behind the world. We had five, 10 metre accuracy and the rest of the world was a lot more accurate in how they positioned. This investment lifts that accuracy to 10 centimetres, it's not very big, 10 centimetres across all of our land, across all of our maritime jurisdiction and across our airspace. So that brings us up to world class standard. But what the budget did was go even further and provided $64 million so that in our capital cities, by using the additional mobile phone networks, we could do additional corrections and we will have three centimetre accuracy from GPS. That is going to be world leading. So not only do we catch up, but we've put that infrastructure in place that will allow us to be world leading. I can assure you that sent a very strong message to the world. The budget also provided 37 million to uh, commercialise some extraordinary work that's been done, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, called Digital Earth Australia, which is something that, uh, that we could set the world standard for, and I'll talk a bit about that. It also provided the ongoing funding to the Australian Space Agency and gave us 15 million to kickstart um, the international discussions. So uh, quite an extraordinary investment. I remind people here in, in South Australia, of course, you see the impact of the defence investment and the defence will be investing $10 billion in the area of space over the next 20 years. And that's, that's a fan, fantastic foundation and ballast to growing uh, the industry. So not just defence, but those companies also supplying into the civil area. So every day we almost forget how space is used in banking, how it's used for television. I'm always astounded when you go to the, the wheat farms um, that sit between Victoria and South Australia and you see the rows that are planted and then next year's row is planted exactly in between last year's where the tiny little stalks then protect the seeds coming up and that is because you can use space to get that kind of accuracy. We forget that, that all of our agriculture is now dependent um, on space. Our marine vessels, of course, need space to communicate. But we are also a country where 99% of Australians have access to mobile phone, but actually only 30% of our geographic area in this large country has that kind of communication technology. So 70% of Australia, I don't have to say this much to South Australians because you know what it feels like when you move out of Adelaide, 70% of Australia does not have communications and that of course will need space. But, but add to that our maritime jurisdiction, we one of the, have one of the largest maritime jurisdictions in the world and then add to that our airspace and everything moving through it and you start to realise how important communication will be. So tonight I wanted to share a little bit about the purpose of the agency. I wanted to also share the strategic priorities of the agency and then um, given that this is the Festival of Ideas, I wanted to put to you that Australia can and should step up and be a responsible global citizen in space and, and look at how we might, uh, we might do that. Space is going to become the defining domain for human ambition for decades to come. And we absolutely must be part of that as a, as a country. Your agency has a very clear purpose, and that is to grow and transform Australia's space industry. It's also to, to increase the use of space across our full broader economy. Everything we do in terms of agriculture, mining, oil and gas, the use of space, we can lead in that. Our partnerships internationally and nationally are critical for this. Australia said we want to be inspired by what Australia can and will do in space. And of course we need to improve the lives of all Australians and take our place as a responsible citizen. We simply can't do this alone. We're certainly not the biggest and we're a little late to this party. 
So our efforts must be underpinned by very strong international partnerships and engaging nationally. We really do have to work together if we're going to run through the legs of giants. I've been really astounded that the response internationally has reinforced one thing for me. We were missing one door and one voice in space. And as soon as we had that, what was extraordinary has been the engagement. Even we've only been up and running um, since, uh, since the 1st of July, we are already in discussions uh, for country to country cooperation agreements with the United States, with uh, the UK, with France, with Canada, with the European Space Agency, with Japan, um, and others are already reached out to us. And that tells us um, that there's an opportunity there for us um, and has been actually quite astounding. On the other side, they think there's hundreds of us sitting at the Space Agency and really there's only a few of us, so it's, uh, it's been kind of interesting. Um, on the positive side, we did have one discussion, and I won't mention the country, it was a very large country, um, and uh, we said we'd like to do an agreement by October, and they sort of said, well, that's not going to be possible for us, and, and they asked um, Alfo, said, what do you think that's possible for you? And he sort of thought, well, I have to talk to Megan, and she used to talk to Joe, and then we'll write it up. Yeah, that's possible for us. <laughs> it's a lot less bureaucracy. Um, we certainly want to open the door so that industry and research can move through. And to do that, of course, we need to understand the strategic priorities um, of industry um, and research. So it's not just about building our industry as well. Um, we definitely want to step up and be a much more responsible um, global citizen because we need to be part of ensuring safe and secure um, operations in space. And, uh, and, of course, healthy operation in space um, and, uh, and on Earth. We also want to share with all Australians the increasing uh, use of space and we want to share with Australians some of the really exciting things that, uh, that are going to be happening and so that Australians can feel proud as we step up and take our place and you can feel proud of the companies, of the researchers, of some of the students and some of the extraordinary things that they will be doing in space. We want to connect parents and children with their curiosity, that natural curiosity that they have with space and, uh, and want to learn more. You're, you're all curious, that's why you're here. And um, I know Mary was saying she's got a bunch of grandchildren that she's trying to get curious. We want to connect that curiosity and have it grow because it's certainly an opening into technology and engineering, science and maths. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful door. And we're going to do some seriously cool things, uh, and we want to share that as well. We'll work closely, very closely, with our federal colleagues, such as the Department of um, Foreign Affairs and Trade. We'll work with CSIRO. We'll work with Geoscience Australia. We'll work with the regulators, such as ACMA and CASA. We'll work with the states and territories and industry to craft national policy and strategy for civil space. A lot of people would argue that we are late to this party. I think Iceland now becomes the only OECD country that doesn't have a space agency. So, um, And it's true, we are late to this party. Um, many of you who would remember Australia's entry into space um, several decades ago in the 60s, we were one of the countries that was right in there and then we sort of, I don't know how to put it, we lost the plot a little um, and we lost that sense of urgency. We want to get to get that back. Um, but we're entering at a really important time. We're entering at a time when space is moving from predominantly in the government domain into the commercial domain. So it used to be several decades ago, three quarters of what was done was, was in the government side. And now that's completely flipped into the commercial. So we're coming into a realm where how we do that and how we work with our industry has completely changed and that does give us a blank piece of paper. We've set the purpose of our agency to be industry focused. We will be one of the most industry focused agencies in the world. We have to be focused because we're small and we don't have a lot of money but we do believe that this is where the future is going. So we're very keen to deliver on your vision. 
the vision of the nation and we're keen to produce an agency that, of which all Australians can be really proud. I wanted to cover the strategic priorities, so for the nerds and tech heads, and I know there's some of you in here, I wanted to go into a little bit of that and, and share where we think Australia can step up. We have to make choices. We have to make strategic choices. We have to lean on our strengths and also nurture some of the areas where we can lead in the world. We do have a lot of strengths. Where we are in the, in the Earth as we look out into both the solar system and the galaxy, where we sit in the southern hemisphere is extremely advantageous um, to us. We've got wonderful education. We've got an entrepreneurial spirit that kind of Aussie can do attitude and, uh, and this can really set us forward. But we've chosen six areas where we believe um, that we need to focus. The first, of course, as I mentioned, is communication. Three quarters of the current space industry here in Australia is connected with using space for communication. So data, not so much voice anymore because, as you know, when you make a satellite call, that that little delay is annoying to us. It didn't used to be 20 years ago. We were grateful, but now it's deeply annoying. Um, and so the space being much more used now for, uh, for data. But space will be a key node in all future communication networks. And when you think of that future, we simply cannot be left out of that future. This is the country that brought Wi-Fi to the world. We can't be left out of the next generation of telecommunications. And this is all sorts of things. It includes high altitude platforms. So putting communication platforms that can sit kind of almost um, uh, at where balloons would sit. So, so not what you would consider space, but much lower, lower down, but can provide instantaneous communication. I think you might need that when the football grand final's here in, uh, here in Adelaide. It also means things like constellations of smaller satellites that can talk to each other and sit much lower down and can give us much lower latency, much quicker communication and can be resilient and talk to each other and are cheaper to get up and running. So just to give you a sense of that cost, we have our NBN um, SkyMaster satellites, billions of dollars over 18 months, very heavy, sit high up and take a long time to build, as I said, 18 months. Um, I was recently at, uh, at one of the factories in France where some of these, some of these satellite con that will go into the constellations can produce one every eight hours and a manufacturing train that produces two a day. That's the difference that we're talking about, 18 months to two a day. This is completely transforming. Uh, in terms of the future, just recently a company, ADVA, um, with German research group, DLR, did a trial using lasers, so using light, using the property of light that it can also be a wave but it also can, can take packets and packets of data. And they used light, they used it from the lab to a mountaintop, so it wasn't from space to earth but it was a, a test. And they got a new record of 13 terabytes of data a second. Now to put that in perspective, that's everything that's ever been written in 30 seconds. And, and I said to a bunch of high school kids, what could you do with 13 terabits a second, and even they were stumped. Because I said, but I said, you're the generation who's got to figure that out. This is an enormous jump in bandwidth, and this is the next generation, and we certainly need to be part of it. We are, as I mentioned, um, you know, 70% of our land mass is not covered uh, by our mobile networks, um, and we need to make sure space is part of that. Very few countries would put in their strategy that they want to have ground stations. We say, well, it's a low margin, you know, why do we sort of need that? But it absolutely makes sense for a country like Australia. We cover 12% of the world's rotation. We're the perfect place to put the connections from space to Earth and the connections from Earth to space for our part of the world. So that's certainly part of our strategy and we want to attract that. We currently host the Deep Space Communication Centres for NASA in Tidbin Villa and for the European Space Agency in New Norcia in the Western Australia. And the reason for that, I, I remember to, when I was at CSIRO and NASA was over and I uh, was talking to, to one of the senior officials and saying you know, he wanted to invest $400 million in Australia to upgrade the facility. 
And, I, and he gave me this enormous rationale. It took about five minutes to, as to why this money needed to be invested. And, and um, I said to him, not really, you, know, you wouldn't invest it if you didn't have to. And then he kind of shrugged his shoulder and says, we have to, because Australia looks into the solar system and therefore we need you for all of our solar system missions to be part of that critical network of California, Spain um, and Australia. And that, of course, made more sense. Uh, more sense to me. So it's a wonderful um, location for, uh, for that. The second area was this position navigation and timing, which is our global, not just the GPS of knowing where you are, but also there's very important information around timing that's used for the banks as well, precise timing. And so I mentioned a little bit about that, but that investment from the budget, as I said, will allow us to now fully automate everything that moves, whether it's an aircraft, whether it's people, knowing where you are, um, whether it's vehicles, etc., we will have the infrastructure in both position, navigation and timing to do that um, and we can certainly go forward. That's absolutely vital for our oil and gas, our mining, our agriculture, also for our transport networks. If you've ever been on the transport networks from Darwin through to Brisbane, um, these are the sort of networks that would be wonderful to fully automate. Uh, we will all already have uh, the largest robot on Earth, which will be the automated train system in the Pilbara. And when you explain that, when you go to the UK to try and make a sense, this is, this is an automated train system that is bigger than the United Kingdom itself. Um, it starts to make it, make, it, uh, make it real to them. The third area is space situational awareness. And recently, Frank Rose from the Brookings Institute did a wonderful paper that outlined you know, the state of play around space um, situational awareness, which is, which is a couple of things, but importantly, the debris that's moving around uh, in space. And the US Air Force is currently tracking 22,000 pieces of space debris that's bigger than 10 centimeters. So it's quite, they're quite large, right? But what's extraordinary is the speed at which they're traveling. Now, we all have rhubars in this country, so we're used to um, objects that you don't particularly want to hit on long drives, but these are travelling at 28,000 kilometres an hour. Can you imagine hitting a kangaroo at 28,000 kilometres? Can you imagine hitting a kangaroo's fingernail at 28,000 kilometres an hour? So this is, can do enormous damage, not just with something that's, that's that large that we're tracking, and there's 22,000 of those, but when you get down even to much smaller specs. And um, I understand that there's a toothbrush and a wrench out there somewhere as well. I wouldn't want to be hit with those at 28,000 um, kilometres an hour. We've also seen, um, when China in 2007 did a destructive missile test of one of its own assets in space, and that resulted in 3,000 pieces of debris that were larger than 10 centimetres, and some of that debris um, uh, potentially would have, would have jeopardised one of China's own um, assets in, uh, in space. So I was kind of thinking, does the star man in a red Tesla, is that space asset or is that space junk going around the sun? So I'm not sure of the answer to that. On top of the space debris, we also have the development of anti-satellite systems as a very pressing challenge. Um, globally. So, so Australia can respond to some of these challenges. I think firstly we can develop resilient and advanced communication networks and have constellations, resilient constellations in space um, that, uh, that give us uh, more security um, than, than simply a single satellite. We can and, and will become a critical node in the global space situational awareness. You sort of need us down here as the Earth rotates and we see certain parts of space. You also need us because sometimes if, uh, if somebody's not looking, some of those assets in space will move and then move back before somebody looks at them. So uh, we're, needed for, we're needed for that. Uh, no guesses as to who might be doing that. Um, also we can do advanced on-orbit technology. So we're just chatting today to a group here in South Australia that's doing that. Because if you've got something coming at you at 28,000 kilometres an hour, and you know it's going to come close, you might just want to sidle a little to the left or sidle a little to the right and get out of its way um, because your satellite or your piece of equipment um, is incredibly valuable. And of course, I think lastly, and in a bigger picture, we can become a 
responsible citizen globally to help with both a rules-based order with the laws and regulations and also the behavioural norms um, that will be needed in space. We're already responding in some of those areas, so um, Australia is already expanding and will, um, with the recent uh, relocation of the USC ban space surveillance radar at Harold Holt in, uh, in Exmouth um, and soon we will have the space surveillance telescope for the much higher orbits that we'll use later as well. And I think Pam you have developed those so we'll be tapping on your shoulders for, uh, for the next generation of those. But we've also got, so we will be a, a key part of that military node and a key part of um, the US military tracking and keeping a catalogue of that debris. But as more and more companies are in space, we also need to provide services to, to the civilian um, and to the civil space uh, area. So there's, we've got some little gems here that we may be able to expand those gems um, to provide that service. We've got things like there's a network um, around West Australia and Australia that tracks meteorites coming in called the Desert Fireball Network. We might be able to use that. The Big Square Kilometre Array Telescope um, can join up with other telescopes in New Zealand and form basically like a massive um, telescope that we can use. And that team tells me we can use that for, uh, for space debris. University of New South Wales has also got a Falcon Telescope and some of the universities like R RMIT are working with companies on algorithms for, uh, for orbit. So we've got lots of little pieces that we may be able to bring together and, uh, and look at how we service uh, a broader commercial realm. We can't do everything at the global level, but I think in this particular area, we could step up. Earth observation was our fourth area. Now, this is where we stepped out a little. Nearly every other country we spoke to said, yes, we use satellites to look down on Earth and there's this fantastic data and we have them moving around, um, capturing different sorts of data. And most countries said, well, we want to set up a series of small companies that can um, provide data analytics, provide different services, whether it's looking in the ocean, whether it's looking at farms, whether it's looking how plants grow, uh, whether it's looking how water changes. And we, um, we actually took a very different track. It might not be right, but we took a different track. And the reason we took a different track is everyone said to us, because Australia didn't have its own satellite, we didn't have our own data that we would call our own, we didn't get distracted by that, and therefore we learned to use everybody else's data from, that was coming from space. And we learned how to stitch it together. In fact, I, I think what Geoscience Australia did was absolutely extraordinary. While other countries were spending hundreds of millions of dollars to put satellites up, Geoscience Australia took 30 to 40 years of data that we already had from satellites, from the US Landsat and other satellites. They drove. And when I say drove, I mean physically drove those tapes to the supercomputer in Canberra. And they loaded it all up and they spent 300 to 400 million dollars. And for every 10 square kilometres across all of our land and all of our coastal region, they took every one of those images, they corrected them, they corrected them for cloud, they corrected them over time. They even corrected them, because in that time Australia's moved a little bit north with uh, plate tectonics. They even corrected for that. And they created for every one of those 10 square kilometres a series of views over time. No other country has done that. And it means now that if you're a company or a researcher, you can say, just give me this area and you don't have to bother with correcting or fixing it. And believe me, as someone who started their life looking at satellite images, it was the bane of my life because nothing quite matched. It all matches, it's absolutely beautiful, and we are going to export that technology. So um, hopefully make that a global, a global standard. So I think that's been extraordinary, and uh, the investment to do that means that, that Australian companies can now just sit on top of that and produce data that's useful. When I say useful, I saw the most beautiful use of that data recently where they'd taken 30 years of data over a small area and said, let's just look at the water, the lakes, the rivers, the water, the rain, and they showed a map of how that had changed over 30 years. They did this work quickly and beautifully and it was just glorious and, um, and that's the sort of thing we can do. We've got some 
Uh, last two areas, we've got some um, areas of strength of our research, such as our astronomy, such as our radio astronomy here in South Australia. Of course, you know the over-the-horizon radar uh, work that's been done by Defence. Uh, so we've got areas to leverage that we will stand on those strengths, but we've also got these little kernels, these little nuggets of areas where we in no way lead the world. But if we nurture them, if we support them, we just might be able to, uh, to step up. Things like artificial intelligence, the robotics, as I mentioned, the data analytics to pull things together. We've got companies here in South Australia looking at the Internet of Things, how they help a dairy or a farm with sensors all over that farm to be able to use um, satellites and constellations to uh, access that data and control what they're doing on their farms. We've got companies that are doing wonderful cyber security. How do you make your communication in space secure um, using things like quantum keys, using quantum mechanics? We've got some, some wonderful kernels of optical laser capability, um, and particularly here at the universities in, uh, in South Australia. We've got companies that are looking at the very next generation of propulsion, whether it's 3D fuel, whether it's 3D rockets we're printing in Victoria, um, whether it's new propulsion systems and advanced propulsion systems. So these are all uh, little nuggets and we think they should be supported. Our last area is one I think Australia will lead the world. And we called it Earth to Space and Space to Earth. Australia leads the world in remote asset management. So I mentioned we have control rooms in Queensland, in Perth, um, here that control assets thousands and thousands of kilometres away. Um, and uh, and we, have auto we have the largest uh, amount of automated trucks, we'll have the first world's automated train. We have our offshore oil and gas platform. What we do in Australia will be done in space and what's done in space will be really useful to us. Those Mars rovers, you know, I can see them out in the Flinders range, I, I really can, but they're going to be very useful. Um, and it's why that Woodside, the uh, petroleum company, is partnering with NASA. So NASA recognised this capability and said, we're developing Robonaut, which is a torso robot, sort of from here up, but very dexterous. So uh, Robonaut has very good use of its hands. Um, and, uh, and NASA says, we need to use it on the International Space Station to do maintenance, where we're taking the humans out. And Woodside goes, well, we've got an oil rig that's about as complicated as a international space station and we need to do the same maintenance and have two or three robonauts and that's exactly where Australia can do this. This is such a glorious partnership. So I, you know, we can see a lot more of that happening already. Our mining industry will of course need to connect with the space industry and so will agriculture. So I wanted to conclude tonight and, um, and I think we're going to have a bit of Q&A as to why I think Australia must reinvigorate our space diplomacy with our allies and with our partners and, uh, and also in our region and step up and be a responsible global citizen for safe, secure and healthy operations uh, in space. Why, why is this really important? Because space is becoming more contested, it's becoming more congested and it's becoming much more highly competitive than it has ever been. It's also a resource, we don't think of that, but it's, it's also a resource that need, we need to approach wisely um, and we need to think about how we do that with new states coming in, with new countries coming in, with commercial entities, with multilateral entities, with even non-state players coming into that, uh, that area. And the access to space is obviously vital now, but as I've outlined, the access to space will be even more important in the, in the future. Australia's had a very, very long and enduring interest in the peaceful use of outer space. We were one of the 24 founding members of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is called the UN Copulus, in 1959. And Australia has continuously chaired the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee for over 30 years in the United Nations. So we do actually 
have a very respected role there. Just recently, Alex Zanetta from the Australian Space Agency was at COPUS and presented when a, when our national statement was presented, which highlighted the new agency, but it also reaffirmed Australia's commitment to our obligations consistent with the United Nations space treaties. We're absolutely committed to strengthening the rules in space, the regulations in space, and also the norms of behaviour in space, and that includes the military uses of, uh, of space. I think as evident for that, we are one of only 16 countries in the world that is party to all five United Nations treaties. So we'll work with our partners, we'll work through the United Nations um, Committee, we'll work <coughs> multilaterally and bilaterally to strengthen those rules and laws and norms. We're also planning to engage with the United Nations strategically in their next strategic planning phase to 2030, and particularly how we use space for, to pursue the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It's kind of interesting, we go into space and we're going to learn about how to care about our own planet and use space um, to do that. Those multi-level obligations and multilateral obligations and our, um, are actually very important as well for industry. Um, and we're in the process as a country of upgrading our regulations, our framework and our laws to modernise them, to make sure we don't inhibit innovation, but also to balance what we do with our international obligations. So in, we had a Space Activities um, Act of 1998 and that was um, that sort of implements, if you like, our obligations under the United Nations Treaty. And uh, it established the licensing frameworks for uh, activity in space. The Space Agency now will look after that responsibility. But we needed to review that because the technology's changed, because we don't want to inhibit innovation. We, really, things have changed fundamentally, the cost, the entry, um, the mechanisms, the orbits have all changed, and so we need to upgrade our, uh, our frameworks and our legislation. So where are we at with that? My friend um, Stephen Freeland, who was also on the expert review group, did a review of the Space Activities Act and, uh, and presented his work in November 2016. And then in May this year, uh, the Australian Government introduced the Space Activities Amendment, which is for launches and for returns and that bill um, was just put into, into Parliament. So it won't be debated yet until the spring season, which is in August to December, uh, but it's currently being looked at by the Senate uh, Economic Legislation Committee. I finally managed to say those four words in the right order. It's taken me a while. I had to practice that actually this afternoon. Um, so the committee then um, looks, at, looks at that. The committee is receiving submissions right now uh, from interested parties. It will do its report and then there will be work done on, the, on producing this new regulatory framework. So the agency will work on that and will engage, of course, um, with stakeholders um, on its draft, uh, a draft position. So we do have this opportunity, um, as I've outlined, to be a global leader and to really step up and we've got some exciting areas where we think we can lead. I've mentioned we need to step up as a global responsible citizen for the safe and secure operations um, in space. And we also need to provide a regulatory framework that gives certainty to industry and allows our industry to be competitive internationally. So no other, indus no other industry can inspire na nations like space. And uh, you know, I say that because it's where human ambition can set its sights on interplanetary missions, it can set its sights on colonising, it can set its sights on even finding new life, it can set its sights on looking back on its own planet and taking care of our own planet. And we've been able to dream, I think, this big because we've seen that technologies that have been developed through space have completely transformed the way we work and the way we communicate, and certainly will do in the future. Thank you very much. Um, will you be considering any um, science uh, missions in the future? 
It's a great question. In our discussions with the various agencies, uh, we're already looking at uh, potential joint missions. And we're particularly looking at that at the lens of how do we get Australian technology, how do we showcase what we're doing with our industry, but also where those missions can um, provide a broader, if you like, broader value to uh, our, our economy. So we are looking at that. Um, and I think some of the science missions allow you to ask some pretty extraordinary questions. So we'll be certainly looking at those things. Um, we're not, it's not about, it's really not about uh, having the budget that someone like NASA does of $20 billion a year to be able to fund significant um, missions, but we absolutely want to be part of those and where it makes sense for Australia. Um, I'm just wondering about the secondary education as a teacher. I'm wondering if there's a push and part of your brief, if there's any scope for secondary education. There's certainly, I think, the scope... Um, not just all the way through. So how, how do we capture that curiosity at the very beginning? How do we bring it all the way through the education system? And then how do we have the skills that we're going to need uh, for this industry? Um, and then how do you bring back and make sure we're educating people like Mary to be able to educate their kids? So how do we do that whole uh, loop as well? We, we had discussions today with the, with the South Australian Government and this particular issue um, came up as well, particularly the skills base. So it's, it's an enormous challenge, but on the other side it's a wonderful opportunity because you see the way that, that kids' curiosity responds to space and so it's just a wonderful mechanism to teach such a broad spectrum of you know, engineering and maths and all of those things. I, I, had the, um, I haven't been to Hamilton. Are you at Hamilton? Um, I went to the Victorian um, Space School Education Centre where they have half the class is on the surface of Mars or in their spacesuits and kids up and speaking and the other half is in the control room and I've never seen you know, two bunches of kids that were more engaged and, uh, and working as teams etc. It was just phenomenal and you know that they were going to go home that night and share that with their brothers and sisters and families etc. Uh, it was just an extraordinary experience for them. And I felt like I was 10 again, so uh, it was pretty exciting. Should, should Australia ever develop launch capability, or is that a game we just shouldn't play? It's a great question. I mentioned that the, the nation was very united in its advice to us. The one area where it was not united was launch. So at one end of the spectrum, there was, look, we've got lots of launch capacity um, in itself. Uh, it's not where the value is. It's in the value of getting your assets into space. Um, that was one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, we had advice saying we're going to have so much new demand for these smaller satellites and constellations um, that you know, we may need launch. And somewhere in the middle are things like space tourism and whether we need those activities. Now, really where we landed in the review was to say that this is not an area that we recommended for taxpayers' dollar. Um, but it was an area where if, if there was a commercial opportunity and a commercial group could see that market, could feel that they could establish themselves, then there was a role for government to support and facilitate that and make sure the obligations were clear. Um, so not an area we're recommending. I think the other aspect is it was, it's, it's just quite hard to see that supply demand position right now. I think it will develop and we'll get a clearer picture, uh, a picture of that. Um, so if not an area that certainly didn't have a single answer. Um, you've spoken, um uh, clearly, I think about the um, opportunities and um, the kind of whiz bang factor about space, the, the really remarkable uh, achievements of sophisticated technology. But you really haven't spoken about the risks and downsides, particularly for ordinary citizens. So, at the same time that all the things you're talking about are happening, um, we, in recent years, we've become far more aware that uh, cyber uh, war is part of our current reality, that mass surveillance is, is now part of our everyday, and you've indicated that this is taking a, a further nudge along with uh, more refined GPS technology. Um, you're talking about international cooperation being a reality of the way this system works at the moment, we have this system largely doing what it pleases and it 
it seems a real issue for, for us in the present day, but certainly for young people into the future, much more so. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, there are risks, I think, with technology, and we've seen there's the light and the shadows, and you highlighted some of the shadows, some of the cyber risks, which are invading a lot of what we're doing in the data space as well. Um, highlighting some of the potential uses of space for military use, etc. As I mentioned, that sort of anti-satellite area. So there are shadows and light, and I think um, it's very important to highlight the shadows as well as the light. Um, so I completely agree with you. And then if we take those shadows, how, how do we make sure, as you said, that those shadows uh, are clear and, uh, and, and that we illuminate what's actually happening there and that that's, there's a sense of, of openness around that. Um, my discussion on why, why Australia can step up and should step up as being a responsible citizen in, a, in part is to, is to respond to some of these aspects in the shadow. And, and Australia can, can be and is recognised as a somewhat of a neutral broker. We're not that threatening in that we, uh, we don't have a, a huge presence, but we also have a significant presence in our region. And I think we will take those steps carefully and we will take those steps slowly. Um, but we do see that, as I think, as a responsibility um, to make sure that we have a voice in, uh, in, in making sure we're managing those shadows and that people feel comfortable in, in, uh, in that area. So, it's a, I mean, it's a, we, could, we could have a whole uh, another evening on that, but thank you for highlighting, as I said, the, the, the light and the shadows on all of these issues. I'm Byron Reeson from Deloitte. My question in some way builds on that, but uh, flips it back the other way. We've just had this... Um, wonderful example this week with uh, an Adelaidean, uh, uh, Dr Harry Harris, uh, helping lead a wonderful collaboration, international collaboration, rescuing those um, young Thai boys in that cave. And it sort of, I guess it brings me to the, the positive side of how we can, uh, can, can use uh, you know, the space agenda. But I, I guess I want to play this point of collaboration. So this, that, that was a great example of focus and a need to collaborate. And I just wonder whether you might be able to unpack a little bit more your thoughts around... I mean, there's no doubt in the, from a Deloitte point of view about the, the need for collaboration, but it's sometimes easier said than done. I think, you know, the way the various states are bidding for your attention, and really the game's a global one. But to, can you just maybe just speak to the, the challenges and the priorities around collaboration just a little more? Yeah, well, it was a good start that the nation had, had a coherent and single voice. That was a really good start. I've been involved in lots of things, and I said to, as I said to the Prime Minister, I've never been involved in anything where the entire nation knew exactly what it wanted. And not just knew exactly what it wanted, it knew what it wanted government to do. And I said, that's never happened to me before in my whole life. And, I, and, it, and it actually said it wanted government to do something, which was, which was extraordinary. So I think we do have um, a, quite a united position. Um, yes, there's been quite a bit of talk in the media about the competition that's going on between the states and territories, but actually when I work with all of the players and, and you talk with them, there's actually an enormous sense of goodwill and a sense of collaboration and a national view. So um, certainly what's portrayed um, is not what I'm seeing on the ground. And, I, and the third aspect is how we collaborate internationally. And this is really about shared ambitions. Uh, we need to understand the ambitions of other countries and our partners uh, and understand our own and, uh, and share those. And that, that sounds very simple, um, but I think we can certainly do that and the way we've been welcomed in, into these collaborations. Why do they want to collaborate with us? Um, I think there's a real recognition of the ingenuity and smarts of Australia that's deeply respected and perhaps we forget um, that sometimes, uh, and so I've certainly seen an enormous um, welcoming to say yes, bring some of the clever things that Australia does into this realm. So there's an opportunity for us. We can't do everything, um, but we can work with those countries where it makes sense. What really struck me was that Australia's also been advising on the medical aspects of human um, space travel for decades now um, through the work that that we, we really led in the Antarctic um, 
monitoring what we were doing in Antarctic and our teams, etc. So we've actually been part of this, but my understanding is we've never been able to have an Australian, even as lead medic, medical officer on those missions, um, as well as, as you mentioned, we've had Australians in space. But even getting into space is changing. So now we have the opportunity of space tourism, we have the commercial players in terms of servicing things like the International Space um, Station. So we also want to look at what that might look like in the future, and it might not look like it looked in the past. And so I think that's quite a broad, a broad question and what those opportunities um, are. And, uh, and we're engaging on, on all of those fronts and, uh, and also <coughs> thinking. One of the thoughts that we had is that, uh, you know, I think the Australians actually do want to see that. So we're looking at, we're even thinking about how you might crowdsource that with 25 million people. So all sorts of, all sorts of um, ideas, but importantly, how you put humans in space is also going to change as well. The Women's Peace Group that I'm involved with, we've always observed Keep Space for Peace Week. And so, of course, we're a bit nervous hearing all about this, but uh, we were pleased to come and hear about the good side of it too. But I'm just wondering, I mean, we've got a Prime Minister who is joined with the hip with the US. Now, how are you going to be able to, if he says, come on, you've got to do something, the US want the use of this for military, how can we genuinely really keep space for peace? It is a great question because we have our obligations, as I said, international obligations. We're working at that at the United Nations level on the peaceful use of outer space. We also have our strong allies, uh, one of which, and one of our strongest allies, of course, being the United States and, and a partner for us. So Australia has always balanced our international obligations, our commercial relationships as well in the region with our fundamental mateship um, with our allies, and I, and I think we can balance um, those. We've certainly balanced them in the past, um, and, uh, and we'll need to continue to balance them in the future. I've read this new legislation. Why can't we have at the introduction of the first page a statement of why Australia's policy should be in space, rather than going to the first clause talking about some regulation? Our associations raising that, I don't know, others are, so we would like a statement of policy in that legislation that ultimately one day I finish with the chances of this agency becoming a statutory authority under law established by Parliament, responsible direct to a minister and the cabinet rather than as a section of the department because I think it's far too important to be a subsection of a department. It should be a statutory authority with its own budget, its own responsibility to a minister. And I know in the next four years is going to be a real, but I hope it doesn't take four years to get a positive answer. Look, thanks, Chris, and thanks for your, your, all your help to help get us where we needed to, to get to. So that's um, deeply, deeply appreciated. We're in listing mode on the location side of things, so we'll finish um, that engagement over the next few weeks, pause, and then come back. Um, and, of course, I've got the difficult job of putting forward a proposal that makes sense um, uh, nationally. In terms of... The statutory authority, which was the recommendation of the review, has been accepted um, by the government, um, but a time frame to get to statutory authority, which we sort of made sense because we said if we said to be a statutory authority on start, then it would have actually delayed the start another two years. So this was a bit of a, a, a bit of a compromise. We are already working on the charter for, for that. Um, and the way it's been set up inside the department um, actually, I report directly to the Minister, I don't report to the Secretary, so it's been set up um, as an agency that has direct reporting to the Minister already, um, and we're looking to report to Cabinet. So, so your comments and input will, will certainly be, be covered, and the legislative piece here, we're right in the middle of getting all of those. I think SAA has put in a submission, so thank you very much for that.